The live session of the CAM chart. My name is Ndiro Ganga. I am a business journalist with Metropole TV. I act as a news reporter, news anchor, and today I am your moderator for the conversation. Now, today we are talking about accelerating a circular economy in the country. And just to bring you up to speed with some of the statistics, now, most of the economies are using a linear model. And if you did not know, a linear model is take make waste so you acquire a natural resource you make a product you use the product and discard it now this has led to a global loss of about 4.5 trillion usd and this conversation is trying to address this challenge how can we take advantage of a circular economy where we make we use reuse recycle and then make again i am joined by a very able panel and they'll introduce themselves before we get into the conversation let's start with you gentlemen uh, thank you. My name is uh, Nicolas Oguge. I'm a professor of environmental policy at the Center for Advanced Studies in Environmental Law and Policy, University of Nairobi. Great I'm to have you. I'm glad to be here. Great to have you. Good lady. I'm Jessica Shugi Waweru. I am the country manager of Petco, uh, which is uh, the trading name of the Kenya PET Recycling Company, Kenya's first producer responsibility organization. It's a Great pleasure to be here. Great to have you. Mm -hmm. Finally, I am uh, Joyce Njogu from the Kenya Association of Manufacturers, the Head of Consulting and Business Development. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Quite an able panel, as you can see. Let's mm -hmm. start with you, Dr. Ari. And um, I would like you to help the viewer probably understand what is a circular economy in, in entirety. Right. Uh, I think you gave um, a brief but uh, apt you know, uh, description. Uh, but essentially, when you're talking about circular economy, mm -hmm. Uh, we are really uh, concerned about uh, you know, resource and material uh, conservation in the sense that, uh, for instance, a, a company will use energy, but you want to ensure that uh, that energy use is uh, done in a, in a way that is not wasteful. Uh, use of water is, is done in a sustainable way, but also materials per se, if they have materials in, in their system and they have what to them might be waste that can actually be used by a different company as a resource. So you keep materials in the system for much longer. Um, you conserve energy, you perhaps in a system, you can have a situation whereby the companies uh, you know, that generate heat, pass that heat to a different company to use it uh, for purposes of their manufacturing. So you have a, a web of systems that uh, entirely uh, reduce wastage. So that uh, in the end, uh, you, as much as possible, you try to keep materials in the system and reduce extraction uh, from the environment. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great. Joyce, at Petco, you do something very interesting. And you said you're the pioneers in terms of recycling of waste. What informed that decision by Petco, that line of thought? Mm. So I think uh, Petco is an industry-led body. So we represent actual manufacturers and producers of uh, companies that are using PET, which is a type of polymer, polyethylene terephthalate, to make plastic bottles commonly used in your soda, your water, your juice, your cooking oil, or your milk packaging. Um, what informed the decision to start it? Of course, there's usually um, external and internal forces. Internally, it was an increased level of consciousness by our members. Um, the point had come when they all had decided collectively, individually, that it was important for them to be responsible and take action for managing their own waste. Um, but externally, of course, there was legislation, um, there's a global, um, I would say, uh, uprising against plastic packaging. And so it, it was the time, the time was ripe, and so they decided it was important to come together to deploy a solution that had actually been tried and tested in South Africa for the last 15 years. And so we just simply replicated that. Mm -hmm. yes. She does the representation and you also partly do that at the Kenya Association of Manufacturers. Mm -hmm. I want to find out how has your journey been with, with regards to recycling and the uh, circular economy? Uh, thank you. For the manufacturers, of course, uh, circular economy interest came as a result of uh, the climate challenges that we've had, where you find uh, access to raw materials is challenged, mm -hmm. a lot of uh, resources are depleted, and so there's a lot of competition to just get raw materials to put into the production processes. So as a result, there was the thinking of how can we be more cost efficient, 
how can we promote more use of resources as they are so from a business perspective where then you're looking at uh, efficiency around all your resources whether it's raw materials or the production process or logistics around how you distribute your products and of course the appraisal around reuse and recycling as a result of the waste management challenges that have been there. Mm -hmm. From there, then the industries, of course, saw opportunities around how to minimize waste as uh, we utilize or optimize uh, resource efficiency. At the association, uh, it's been a long journey, actually, since 2001. There was a lot of uh, complaints around the high cost of energy. So we started with energy efficiency programs where we're promoting optimization of uh, equipments and technologies that could use least energy and still increase uh, production capacity without affecting uh, volumes. So a lot of awareness programs to just increase uh, awareness around how the amount of energy we are consuming, the CO2 emissions that are going out and the costs are affected. Mm -hmm. And as a result, we started even a, an award scheme where we're able to measure uh, the kind of uh, sustainable practices in business and from those measurements then we saw that the savings were quite high just from the award scheme about 13 billion has been saved in form of Kenya shillings from uh, f over the years and uh, around that also we looked at uh, other policies like she said legislative frameworks that could create incentives and the first having been a time of use tariff you know that uh, time of use tariff came as a result of the wastage around the steam from geothermal that wastes away at night. So we said, how can that be reused back into the system at a lower cost to reduce the cost of energy, which was an issue. Mm -hmm. And it's been a long journey. We went into water, water efficiency programs, wastewater programs, and uh, also balancing between the consumers, the environmental issues arising out of uh, the society and responding to them, mm -hmm. like issues of effluent discharge, responding to how then do we make sure we are treating water and not misusing. The scarcity of water resources also brought in the angle of, okay, how do we then use the water more efficiently? So whether it's recycling or uh, treating the water or using that water as an input for somebody else because uh, and with reducing waste, technologies around how you can use the, the right technologies to uh, you reduce waste of water mm -hmm. and after that we went into a lot of trainings uh, whether it's on carbon footprint analysis to be able to understand or measure your, imp your footprint in the environment we've gone into clean technologies promotion we've gone into of course uh, profiling uh, these industries and the kind of work they're doing in the counties and helping counties to come up with the right legislations, it's a long journey. <laughs> you asked about the journey, it's quite long. Well, <laughs> it's, it's quite a long journey as yes. you put it. And from the first round of answers, we can just mm. see that a circular economy, just in its name, it's very circular in nature and yes. holistic, takes yes. care of all the other aspects. Well, this is not a conversation that we are having alone. We'd love for you to be a part of that conversation. The hashtag we're using is try to sustainability on Twitter, talk to us at come at Ganga, and we'll be glad to sample some of your feedback with regards to sustainable economy in the country, the strides that we are making, and the challenges that you face if you're in this kind of business. Dr. Ari, I want to find out from you, um, what is the role of academia in achieving a sustainable and a secular economy? Yeah, I think um, that's a very important question, but uh, you know universities are, the, are system thinkers, so they're supposed to be the engines of uh, skill and knowledge development. Mm. And uh, because of that, uh, they should be able to uh, work with industries uh, to propel the circular economy approach, uh, but also to come up with systems that can help in the sustainability of such systems uh, in, in the industry. So um, I think Dr. Njogu talked about uh, the level of uh, efficient use of resources they're talking about. So universities, can come up with systems of helping in eco-effectiveness, uh, eco-efficiency of such systems. And uh, for instance, um, uh, Dr. Job talked about the climate component and uh, therefore carbon footprints. Now, that they're already doing something about it. The industry is already doing something about it. So now, working with the academia, with the universities, then what can happen is how do we move it from uh, you know, what they have to carbon positivity. How do we, not just uh, reducing carbon footprint, but moving to carbon positivity. In other words, uh, how can we work with industry to ensure that the products they have 
but also the processes they have has got economic, or, or, sorry, have got environmental benefits. Mm -hmm. And therefore, uh, instead of releasing carbon, ends up even absorbing carbon from mm -hmm. the system. Mm -hmm. Then there are systems that are um, also mentioned was about uh, water efficiency. But uh, we can work with them to go just beyond that. How can, if you say take just the water sector, how can we move it uh, from just using potable water to wastewater, which um, currently the industry is doing, eh? but move beyond that? Eh? How can we then move on to generate um, energy from that, but also to generate other resources? And for instance, uh, from potable water, you get the wastewater. That wastewater, uh, perhaps you can even um, convert it to, uh, to biogas and then generate electricity from the biogas. And then if you do that, you'll have a sludge that remains. That sludge, you can have to convert it to fertilizer that can be used in agriculture. Mm -hmm. So you see, these are the kind of uh, possible systems that uh, university can, uh, you know, can do. So, that, uh, so there's a lot of opportunity of uh, working in area of sustainability uh, with, with the industry. And um, um, you could see that uh, it's not like universities are not doing it. Okay. Globally, they are. But the countries that uh, we know that the academia industry link is very strong and is actually having a lot of benefits mm -hmm. is China, United Kingdom, uh, we have uh, Italy, Netherlands, and Germany. Um, other countries are trying, but those are the really sort of um, level that standards that we need to get to. Okay. Um, it doesn't mean that um, there's not much going on in countries like Kenya. Uh, for instance, uh, we have uh, a work that uh, University of Nairobi, uh, in collaboration with Kenyatta University, uh, Kenya Industrial Research Development Institute, uh, Rubicom, and even CAM is involved in this, uh, together with the University of Copenhagen. We are working together with uh, the, the in industry in uh, Roraka Zone, and the idea is to try to improve on their efficiency mm -hmm. in resource use. So we've uh, undertaken research, because initially we have to understand the whole system, and now we are going to be going back to them and uh, trying to uh, show them the, where they can improve mm -hmm. on their efficiency, um, you know, what they can cut down and how they can be more competitive. Okay. Yeah. Joyce, what are some of the challenges that you guys have faced in this journey of recycling? You're smiling. They look like there are many. <laughs> <laughs> it's not easy. Um, I think if you look at um, Kenya as uh, being an African emerging economy, uh, the issue around waste management, even for developed economies, is not an easy one. And so it's, we are no exception as Kenya. So for us, recycling uh, has been, um, I would say, not bittersweet, but not very easy either. Uh, ideally, because we, as I said, we pioneered something that hadn't been done before, which is to really establish a producer responsibility organization. Um, the National Environmental Management Authority, the Ministry of Environment have um, conceptualized extended producer responsibility but it had not actually been deployed or implemented before. So whereas it is known by manufacturers that they have to be responsible for their own waste, there's been no um, actual uh, initiative to actually kind of centralize that activity. And so that's where we came in. The challenges have been that we don't have actual legislation that actually governs our operations. Uh, so it's purely voluntary in the nature that we operate. As I said, we are uh, working on a system that has been tested and tried in South Africa, where we work with recyclers, we subsidize the cost of recycling, which is really the cost of purchasing this material to create a value so that there's a reason why you and I want to take back our material to a recycler. And so if we look at the nature of waste collection in Kenya today, um, we don't have a really structured way of doing it. We have a lot of people who are unserviced, a lot of residential areas that are not catered to by waste collection services. And even over and above that, we have uh, a lot of our waste is unsegregated at source. Mm -hmm. 
which means that it is being collected together cumulatively and being taken to dump sites where it's then recovered through scavenging uh, and then the different recyclables are taken for recycling. So that in itself is a challenge because in order to optimize our recycling activities, we need con uncontaminated waste, which means we need segregation at source programs. And though at the county level, most bylaws within the county, you'll be surprised, actually have this as a law that you should be segregating at source, but the infrastructure doesn't exist. Um, private sector, it's, it's not our mandate as private sector to actually roll it out. Uh, government should actually be stepping up and doing that. It's also not very easy for them because it's very hard to change a system that has been a certain way for very many years and all of a sudden wake up and try and change it. So for us, the opportunities have been around partnerships. Uh, we've built a lot of partnerships. Kenya Association of Manufacturers uh, collectively trying to reach out to other manufacturers to join us. Uh, we call ourselves the coalition of the willing and so to onboard those other members who are willing uh, despite the voluntary nature of our organization. We're also working with uh, Kenya Private Sector Alliance. The Ministry of Environment has actually been a very critical partner for us. Uh, the strides we've made have been really central around uh, their desire to see us succeed. Mm -hmm. uh, also the National Environmental Management Authority, they have been very instrumental as partners to us. Mm -hmm. So those are the opportunities I would speak of. Mm -hmm. Speaking of waste, Joyce, mm -hmm. you are with the Kenya Association of Manufacturers mm -hmm. and your members more often than not are accused of, mm -hmm. despite the fact that they are productive, they also have uh, wasteful tendencies, releasing waste into the environment. And it's, it's been controversial, some waste is treated, mm -hmm. some is not. From where come sits, mm -hmm. would you address some of the prospects that you are using to ensure that your members mm -hmm. do their due diligence in terms of waste management? Thank you. I, I think uh, when we talk circular economy, there's a lot of thinking around waste management. I just want to mention waste in two forms. There's waste management where you already have waste and you have to manage it. And there's waste prevention. Mm -hmm. So we start with manufacturers, we've been more keen on waste prevention as a strategy mm -hmm. uh, before we get into managing what is already wasted. Eh? And for waste prevention, of course, we start with design of the product. How do you design a product that's more durable? Back to those olden days where we valued durability. You know, people used to say, oh, the 504 is overstaying. And then we went into seasons of fashion and you want to keep changing either your car or your shoes or your clothes. And then the more you change your clothes, the more people then want to do cheaper things that have a short shelf life. Because either way, you're not going to use it for long. So that started taking us backwards into uh, generating more waste. But then in this new season, we are saying, do we then, uh, should we not go into producing more durable products? products that can be reused uh, you know in its original form or they are easy to repackage and remanufacture or you make them in smaller parts that you can be able to separate like the phone the way it just dies surely there are some aspects of the phone that can be reused or uh, you can use some and then you decide on what will be wasted so we are starting from think rethinking how we design products as a waste prevention strategy and then of course uh, how we then upcycle also some of those products and uh, like the building and construction, there's a lot of demolition going on or upgrading of buildings. So when, for instance, you remove these sockets, how do you clean them up for reuse? You know, if you're removing these frames for the doors, they can be cleaned up, remanufactured in a way that they are made better and reused. Even floor tiles, people are reusing floor tiles or the wooden floors, they can be reconstructed and reused to cut down waste then from there if we must have waste then we go to waste management mm -hmm. so that is beyond the theory behind the theory of zero waste moving towards zero waste and that's where circular economy actually is thriving so when we go to waste management is what she's talking about the collection mechanisms first of all defining is your waste correct because if you're disposing waste is that waste reusable if and there should be a system of measuring the type of waste that's going to the dustbins whether it's household level or industry level because waste really is a societal problem not just industries there's a lot of focus like you said that it is manufacturers who have a lot of waste but we are producers yes. we are producers of uh, products mm. so our role really is educating the public how can you use this product for a longer time how can you also find a new use 
like what we are doing with buckets for Omo, mm -hmm. uh, over time they become buckets for washing clothes, mm -hmm. just to try and simplify. And that bucket never gets thrown away. So it finds a new use. So you can find a new use. So it's the education we are doing as manufacturers. I'm producing this product for your first use. Second or secondary use can be for such a particular thing. Even us women, we are using, some of us are using blue band uh, tins to actually pack food in the fridge now that plastic packaging is out. Mm -hmm. And then thinking packaging. So what packaging is being wasted? And that's where even people like universities come in around R&D, research and development, looking at innovations and technologies that can help us produce what we need. So as manufacturers, as I mentioned earlier, we have programs that are business level, looking at business models. How do we improve this business model that you're having to help you reduce waste from the type of raw materials that you're receiving and how you reduce as much as possible getting raw materials from the environment mm -hmm. and whatever you have how can it be used for a longer time and how can you also partner i like what she said about partnerships and that's what we are doing with ruaraka as a pilot ruaraka is a pilot we are doing on circular economy a project between public and private sector mm -hmm. and one of the biggest things there is to assess the type of waste we chose ruaraka because of dandora dump site mm -hmm. we looked at dandora and saw what kind of wastes are there from bottles to um, plast uh, the plastic paper bags, to general organic things, a lot of waste. So we started measuring how much waste is taken to Dandora dam site and which industries are utilizing that waste. So in Rarako already there are people using plastic waste to make slippers, just slippers, you know, instead of now going back to the environment to look for petrol and diesel and make rubber so that, or other types of plastics to do the slippers. You go back to the dump site. So the dump site alone, alone is a huge resource. So that's why we piloted, but it cannot be done by industries alone. Mm -hmm. It needs government, it needs universities to help with R&D, it needs technology developers to come up with relevant technologies to support industries, it needs consumer awareness. The consumer, as much as I can educate you, I can't really control you on how you choose to waste your products. Even glass, you choose, once it's broken, you choose to dump it, mix it with organic waste, somebody can give it to a company that can recycle into very beautiful building materials, like these lampshades. They can be done so nicely with different colors, so there's a lot of opportunity and jobs to create from circular economy. Mm -hmm. And let's partner with industries, they have invested a lot in understanding their products and their raw materials. And we welcome consumers to also give us ideas on how they want to use certain, whether it's a packaged material or the content within the product, and we co-create. Yeah. Yes. Joyce, I saw you nodding when Joyce was speaking. <laughs> you sort of agree with her. Mm -hmm. uh, first, I want you to probably maybe take the opportunity point a notch higher. Any other opportunities available in the circular economy, and then we'll come to something else. I think she mentioned something really, really critical, which for us is central. And uh, one of the opportunities we have right now is design for recycling. So we as an organization are encouraging our members to optimize their designs so that you're not just putting out a plastic bottle for soda, for water, mm -hmm. but is your plastic bottle that is going out, can it be collected and actually be recycled? Because you'll be surprised a lot of bottles, some of the bottles that are out there in the market um, whereas it might look like your normal plastic bottle PET nature, it has issues around the labeling that has been used, which is of a different plastic polymer, which renders it almost unrecyclable. So it has to be, ideally, the, the, the only way to discard it is to incinerate it. And that's not what we want, because then we are throwing away a valuable resource. Mm -hmm. So we are looking at how can we optimize our design so that then it's something that can be recycled. The color of your bottles. Why do we have, for instance, light blue bottles in Kenya? If you go to other countries, our drinking water in plastic bottles actually clear bottles. And a clear, bottles, a clear bottle actually produces better recyclable material than the light blue ones. So those are some of the issues we are looking at. How can we begin to turn that around? So Kenya uh, Bureau of Standards then becomes a very critical partner because then the issue around standards becomes very critical. Mm -hmm. Another opportunity, especially with COVID, has come that has, has a reason is that how do we localize this recycling so that then we start to use our own uh, local content to create new products locally. If it's a new bottle, can we actually do this locally? What do we need? 
Do we need to work the back end so that we know do we, how do we improve our collection system so that we get more uncontaminated material, mm -hmm. keep the material local, make new bottles. Even if we just have, for instance, 20 to 30 percent recycled content in a new bottle, we'll be using less amounts of plastic going in. Mm -hmm. yeah. Prof, I'll come to you briefly, but just I want to stay with you. If you mm -hmm. look at international brands, say, for example, H&M, mm -hmm. they have their own recycling yes. measures in-house where yes. if you buy a cloth for H&M yes. you can take it back after you've worn for a particular amount mm -hmm. of time mm -hmm. you can exchange it at a few dollars and get a new piece or just mm -hmm. donate it mm -hmm. what are you guys doing to ensure that you link the producers mm -hmm. of some of these waste materials mm -hmm. back to their products yeah so that's a very good question and, and and i almost kind of suspect where you're asking it from so if you go to europe you have the deposit return system where i would use my bottle and then put it back into like almost a vending machine and it would give me back a receipt that i can go and claim and that bottle would go directly into recycling so uh is that the, why are we not using that model here largely because the retail sector in kenya where you find the deposit system would be used um, is very kiosk based so it's very informal in nature also the nature of our retail being informal and dispersed means we are not able to have you and i easily walk into a brick and mortar facility because our kiosks are usually mabati and some wood and they're very semi-permanent in nature so to input that kind of investment a deposit return system would require our retail system to actually put in resources that at present they do not have. Also, um, asking Mama Mboga to put in money to put up that infrastructure, it doesn't make sense. So what have we done in the interim is to partner with different people across the board to set up buyback centers. So you can be able to go and trade your merchandise, your, your recyclable material, get some money for it. And if that's not what you want, you can actually take back your recyclables to one of our drop-off points that we've put across different malls. And we are deploying every other month at different facilities, even now within the parks where it has been restricted. We are actually asking uh, members of the community to be able to drop off their PET bottles or other plastic bottles. We uh, get, then have contracted people to collect them and take them into recycling. Okay. Yes. Now, as I had mentioned before, this is not just a conversation between us. It's a conversation between us and you. And you've begun sending in some of your feedback with regards to today's conversation. Let's cross over to Twitter. And uh, Prof, I want you to take this. T.W. Manuel says, water shortages is part of our sustainability worries. What can be done about this? Well, I think um, a lot can be done. Um, you see, the, the thing is, it depends. If it's in urban area, of course, then it's uh, a system of, you know, um, water supply system that is more more closed. If it is in rural area, it's more dispersed. Eh? So sometimes it's difficult to supply everybody uh, with water. But we get a lot of rainfall. What do we do with it? Most likely, it comes down the drain. It floods our roads. It floods things and. Um, carry all the rubbish into the river, um, to the oceans. So why can't we have systems of proper water harvesting? And uh, this can be done even at individual levels. So when it's raining, you harvest the water. I, in my rural home, I, um, I don't have access to piped water system, mm. but I have adequate water to run me throughout the year because I ensure that when it rains, I harvest it, I store it, and I use it uh, mm -hmm. properly. So it is, um, th that's one, one of the possibilities. Um, I think in a place like Nairobi, perhaps right now, uh, there are a lot of boreholes all over the place, and that's also definitely depleting the groundwater system. So what can um, you know, the county government uh, do for, for that, and maybe in conjun conjunction with the national government do uh, we need to find a way of, uh, you know, that to that um, groundwater system, we need to repopulate it again. And there could be a system of doing that and ensuring that uh, instead of all this water rushing everywhere, they can be harnessed into some way of getting back to the aquifers. The technologies are there, and uh, it's just uh, our will on how to do it. Now, this can be done in the different um, urban systems. So, uh, so uh, in relation to that question, um, 
there are many ways of uh, trying to solve that. In industries which use a lot of water, um, then what do they do with the waste? Do they just release it? or can they um, reuse it for one way or another. They can recycle it and use it for cleaning, they can uh, recycle it and use it for gardening. Or, uh, for instance, you may find some industries are using mortar to, to generate uh, maybe building materials, etc. Why do they need to use treated water from um, the this, this system? Why can't they work with other industries that have uh, wastewater that can be processed to a certain extent and then they use that one for purposes of uh, you know, uh, their production system. So that way then they reduce the, um, they reduce the pressure on the, on the treated water for domestic and, and other uses. Mm -hmm. So there are many possible ways of doing this. Um, uh, and, um, and again, in rural setup, uh, because the, the water issue is not just for domestic use, but it's also for, for growing crops. And we can have systems of uh, rainwater harvesting within homes for purposes of that. We can have small ponds within homes that can accumulate um, road runoff, and that can be used to, to sustain livestock. That can be used maybe to do some irrigation on, on fruit crops. And we know that uh, this can be uh, not only beneficial, but can actually increase earnings uh, for, for individual farmers. So there are many possibilities. Uh, some can be done at an individual level, uh, some of them are a bit more expensive, but can be supported at the county level. Some, of course, require national level. So um, if you ask me, uh, I'm not so much for big dams that, uh, mm -hmm. in my opinion, have environmental Im implication. They could be perhaps smaller ones uh, dispersed over a period of areas that would be more efficient, but support communities at different levels. So um, that question now depends on you know, what sustainability at what level, okay. at industry level, at home level, at um, rural systems level. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And speaking of sustainability, Joyce, I want to find out from you, as CAM, what types of incentives are you putting in place to encourage your members to adopt the circular economy model? Wow, there are, there are very many incentives. And the first is also on a cost issue as an incentive, uh, especially around water. And uh, I must say, we go back to our learning in primary or it secondary, I don't remember, where we were discussing how does water form? How is water formed? And I think that piece was missing around uh, the water evaporates, the forestry helps. So the water cycle is very big. And uh, one of the incentives for industries is looking at the true cost of water. For you to even pump water into your system, you're using energy cost. If the water is dirty, it affects you in terms of uh, having to clean it up. Once you clean that water, put in the chemicals, another cost which nobody is really calculating, then you have to do a lot of tests and measures to make sure it suits the quality of water that you need to produce what you need to produce. And then later you have to again look at the whole recycling process, the technologies you use. So we've been helping industries to look at the uh, resource mapping how you map out from access to the, to the water, to how you distribute the water, how you dispose the water, whether you have uh, recycled it back or treated the water, and see how you can also sell wastewater. And just as an example, which uh, is possible, is if you're doing milk, for instance, and you have to transition that milk into butter or cheese, you have some water that is a bit milky, and you don't need to waste that. Because that's heavy water and there's some components of milk. And that's where partnerships come as an incentive. You can sell that to another company that does, let's say, chocolates or uh, drinking chocolate hardening. And uh, the incentive currently that is on is how to bring clusters together, like what you're doing at Waraka. Because even selling my waste to somebody costs me money. Yeah. The legislation, unfortunately, charges you for transporting waste. So we are looking at how can that cost for transporting waste be wavered, especially if the waste is going towards recycling or being an input into somebody else's uh, business. And you know, some waste comes even from Kakamega just to come to Nairobi, depending on the type of business. So if that cost is removed totally, so long as you can demonstrate it's for reuse, that is an incentive that industries can use. Mm -hmm. We also have the polluter pay principle that is, being, is coming up. The amount of pollution you put in the environment determines the cost that you pay for the treatment. So that's another incentive that uh, is there for industries to save costs so that you don't pay sewer costs, same as everybody else. 
Unfortunately, the sewer system is also not very strong in the country. It is weakening over time, and the growth of industries and the population is straining this infrastructure. So there needs to be improved infrastructure to help even small businesses that cannot treat water for themselves. They cannot set up their own sewage lines. So we need these industrial zones marked very well with the, a shared uh, sewer line where people then just pay as they pollute. Uh, whatever waste you put there, you pay, or you minimize your waste so that uh, even the municipal is not uh, using so much to recycle the water or to treat it. So those are the opportunities. The other incentive is on uh, energy efficiency, where we talked about tariffs, for instance, the time of use tariff, where you pay less if you consume more than usual, especially in the night, where energy is actually wasted. It's actually wasted into the air at night. So if you increase your production at night, which is also towards uh, a 24 hour economy, and uh, you're able to use less energy, and uh, less cost. Those are incentives. We just lost another incentive which was there for the rebate scheme mm -hmm. where you get 30% rebate off. Uh, it was pulled away with Corona, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, we had hardly utilized it. But it was a huge opportunity that would have created jobs more easily mm -hmm. because there was incentive to expand production and claim a little of that. Mm -hmm. So that's on energy efficiency. The other incentive is uh, consumer market. If the government is strong on driving procurement of green products, for instance, then and having criteria for determining this product is durable, this product is of natural use, it uses less, you know, coming up with a system that says buy this particular product, that's a strong incentive for industry. And it will naturally affect even other consumers who are not necessarily buying uh, from, uh, I mean, uh, not government itself, but general consumers. So if consumers value green products, that's a huge, huge incentive for industries mm -hmm. technology if you get the right technology it gives you the right innovations or the right innovations that can help you also come up with products that are by design are there to stay and you can get more profits if somebody knows like what you're saying about h&m bring back the clothes so H&M is assured that after some time, somebody will bring back clothes mm -hmm. and they'll still buy new products. Mm -hmm. So then they are not stuck with old stock. They have a way of reusing that material. Mm -hmm. You can even start from the earlier. Some people have started services where you don't uh, even buy the clothes. You just hire the clothes like what we do with wedding gowns now. Mm -hmm. It's becoming unreasonable to spend 200000 on a wedding dress when you can just go hire return it mm -hmm. so there'll be less of uh, material used to produce more wedding clothes okay it's not a first consumer good mm -hmm. but at least you can see that is how you can get an incentive so if somebody knows for from one product through reuse and using it as a service i make more money and i use less materials i use less cost in terms of labor the labor that i have to put in place there are so many incentives that are there and of course you're creating jobs this value stream if we just come up with the right value stream, and he was trying to talk about uh, the, value, the agricultural process, if I just use like meat production as an example. If you're producing meat, there's the production at farm level. The farmer mm -hmm. is producing, they're assured of a market maybe from uh, a slaughterhouse, and the slaughterhouse is assured of a market for the meat products. And at the same time, the slaughterhouse can give a sludge for either producing fuel or the same slaughterhouse can get some raw materials from bones to give medicines or whatever else. So if you map out your value chain very well, you all save from the farmer who gets back the manure, is assured of market, is controlled in terms of quality of products, to the consumer who wants just the beef, maybe the steak, or some form of sausage, or whatever else from a meat processing uh, product, uh, system. So you'll find across the value chain there's less waste, there's higher profits, and then you contain yourselves in a partnership that helps you be more sustainable. So it's about sustainable consumption and production, of course, and the issue of uh, which water is one of those, but also sustainable cities. Mm -hmm. When you have a sustainable city where you're consuming only what you need at the time that you need, the communities will be happier, there will be less wastage in the society. Mm -hmm. And then we rethink, how do we manufacture? There are some products you don't need to manufacture, for instance, if they, they are going to bring a problem with the environmental laws and climate issues. So from the onset, even as a startup, if I'm a, new, a young person, I want to start a business, I need to rethink which product is going to give me highest value, how will I optimize in a way non-legislation around climate action will catch up with me and I have to close my business. 
So from the onset, I think through design into my value chain and how I ought to optimize. Okay, great points mm -hmm. there, Joyce. I want to come to you, Joyce, and find out. We want to talk a little bit about legislation. And we know the 2019 finance bill stipulated that there'll be at least a tax, corporate tax break for those who are recycling plastic down to about 15%. How long did that piece of legislation go in incentivizing people in that field? Well, I think it was pulled now with COVID-19 uh, <laughs> and, and government looking for additional uh, revenue. But it was very beneficial in the sense we actually saw an increase in investment back to about a billion Kenya shillings within the plastic recycling sector, specific to PET um, and some other hard plastics, uh, largely because when you're looking to start your own business, most of our businesses in the recycling space are unbankable according to our banking system here in Kenya. And so what that means is people have to look for alternative sources of funding, usually through private equity or other means, which means then incentives around taxation then become very attractive for any entity looking to put money in. So we did have a, a, an influx, especially also in machinery, because we had a rebate around uh, machinery that was coming in for plastic recycling. I think that is still on, but uh, we would need more uh, just so that we can stimulate the industry to a level that then our Kenyan banking sector finds it bankable. Mm -hmm. So it becomes very important to have legislation that supports us, even if it would just be, for instance, I would say maybe 20 years, that allows us to set up, establish, operationalize, then that way that will start bathing other, because one big recycling company would bath many other uh, specialized collection systems that then keep bathing others. So mm -hmm. then the system kind of builds itself. Mm -hmm. yes. I'll come back to you on mm -hmm. the point of more in mm -hmm. terms of legislation, mm -hmm. but Prof, I want to find out from you, what are some of the legislative shortfalls or challenges that we have in this country that are holding back circular economy from coming into life? Yeah, maybe um, to answer that question, I'll piggyback on what uh, Joyce um, has been talking about, but also to bring out uh, the fact that uh, not all plastics are recyclable, mm. and uh, we have huge amount of plastic types that uh, are in the system that we cannot recycle. Mm -hmm. So maybe um, we need legislation that can incentivize uh, the industry to work perhaps with universities to come mm. up with uh, you know, alternative uh, uses of material. Um, most of the material you, you see that uh, are being used maybe for sweets, for biscuits, uh, it is, uh, you know, basically wrapping materials, and a lot of the wrapping materials for food are essentially not recyclable. So they, they, the best you can do is, is recover some energy on them, and, and maybe if they do that, you release other toxins mm -hmm. into the environment. So. Um, we need to have a situation whereby the, um, the, the legislation, well, the policy that is developed uh, is looked at uh, very carefully, but to work with the industries on this so that, um, you know, we, we can, uh, I, I think one of them uh, just mentioned about the green procurement uh, policies, which, which at the moment of that we, we don't have. Uh, but uh, over and above that, uh, we need to have a situation whereby maybe the plastic material type that we are importing are the ones that can be recycled, you know, so that um, it increases the recycling uh, opportunity within the country. Uh, I think it's currently limited, and I think most of the recycling happening is around the water bottle systems, that the, the PETs. So uh, that legislation will be important, and uh, I think it was a little bit mentioned with that uh, the Kenya Bureau of Standards is an important player on that. So we need to clearly identify these materials that are coming in, are they of a given polymer types that we can recycle, so that the type that are of polymer types that can only be wasted into the environment uh, should perhaps not be allowed, eh? or, should, or should be limited. Eh? It just depends on what the end products of that is as well, and if it's something that is um, of, of requirement for use in the country. But at the moment, I think uh, we have inadequate um, laws, 
people. Actually, policies are almost um, minimal. Uh, there are regulations, uh, but they are not adequate to incentivize the whole system of, uh, and, and I think Joyce mentioned that, eh, of maybe even uh, waste exchange, uh, material exchange, uh, which can be a waste to me, but uh, is a resource to somebody else. Um, at the same time, um, you know, that uh, essentially makes, the, it makes it possible for even the, the private sector to improve the infrastructure mm -hmm. for recycling. And I think you just indicated mm -hmm. about the retail system that we have, that is kiosk ETC. Mm -hmm. That system uh, of informality, obviously, um, is, you know, uh, despite that system of informality, what can we do to encourage everybody to start improving on the way they value uh, whatever they have? And, and, and why are we calling something a waste? Because mm -hmm. it's of no value. Mm -hmm. So and how, as an individual, how do I look at things? And, and uh, what I consider of no value can potentially be of value, but that requires also a little bit of education. Uh, at, at different levels, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of, um, uh, oh, and, and also maybe on the legislation side, sometimes you find that uh, there are certain legislation that are conflicting. Um, maybe legislation on agriculture and legislation on energy and legislation on water. S sometimes it's like they don't speak to each other, and we need to harmonize that as well. And uh, you know, uh, that would be useful in terms of helping um, the sector and, and, and maybe uh, just to finalize on that component, uh, we need to, uh, to look at, um, you know, not things in sectoral basis, uh, mm -hmm. but we need to have a, a holistic approach to doing things so that we don't only look at water sector, energy sector, food sector, uh, but we look at them as, uh, as a synthesis of all this that uh, are useful uh, you, know, for, you know, for sustainability purposes. Okay. Mm. Joyce, uh, probably your two cents on what Prof has said and what more can be done in regards to legislation just to seal the loopholes that are there to encourage recycling in the country. I think if we, if we were just to, for instance, learn from what has already been done in other countries where these systems are working, um, you can see that legislation around extended producer responsibility then becomes very integral so that we are not leaving it ad hoc based on those who want to do it and those who don't want to do it. Because then you have a situation where those who are willing are carrying the burden for those who are not. And then that, that becomes unfair. Also, the system is not able to stretch its resources large enough. Um, so we do need extended producer uh, uh, legislation that makes it mandatory for anyone producing, especially a recyclable uh, waste, mm -hmm. one, that they should pay into a scheme of some sort to be able to then use that money to collect and recycle that. And for those who are actually producing or packaging material in uh, unrecyclable uh, packaging, then the incentives, especially fiscal uh, incentives, they should be so punitive to discourage them from using the unrecyclable material that they opt for a recyclable alternative. So then that becomes two things. So we need to give both positive and uh, the negative, which is quite punitive. Also, I'd say we need uh, standardization, uh, especially with the Kenya Bureau of Standards, that then we have uh, standards that govern uh, the use of local content. Uh, if for instance, if we look at glass, uh, your glass bottle today, we need to have what is the standard for the amount of local content that needs to go in. We need to have the same for plastics as well. Now we have uh, companies that have deployed some of their goods. For instance, Biofoods has put out, I think, a yogurt in 100% uh, recycled plastic, uh, albeit it's a, a PP, polypropylene but it's 100% recycled. Unilever has done the same with their sunlight packaging. It's 100% recycled. How can, what is the incentive they are getting? We need to see that incentive also fall for them because those who are putting the same product out to market um, and they are using a material that is not 100% recycled, they should not be getting the same benefit as those who are. So that becomes a standards issue as well as a physical issue also we need to see uh, material recovery facilities. 
Um, I've told you and I've mentioned that our waste is largely unsegregated at source. It's going from your house, my house, directly to Dandora or Kibarani or any other dump site, for example, like Kibarani was closed, but to another dump site. And, and that's, that should not be the case. So ideally it should be, because we are not segregating at all, and even if we were, it should go to a material recovery facility where what is recyclable can be collected, it goes into our recycling plants, and what is not collected complete, whatever is unrecyclable, in totality should then end up at the dam site or in incineration or mm -hmm. actually a sanitary landfill. Okay. Um, so I would say those are the kind of things that for us from a policy point of view then become critical to driving this agenda. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's cross over to Twitter and Joyce I'd like you to take this. Um, uh, African Voices is asking, do we have adequate policies to protect the environment from industrial and treated waste? There's a lot of policies in this country, a lot of legislation, and there are two challenges. One is probably awareness uh, by industries and consumers. I want to bring in consumers here as well. And uh, number two is enforcement from the government side. I think uh, it takes a lot of work to be able to go around and, uh, co and supervise compliance in all industries on a continuous basis. So the first opportunity is awareness, making sure that uh, we are doing compliance support uh, for industries, uh, and I know it's specific to industries. Like at CAM, we've come up with a con environmental compliance support program in partnership with regulators. So there's a lot of regulation. The challenge, of course, is the cost of regulation because different uh, regulators asking for the same thing. If it's water sector alone, you find uh, uh, WRA is asking for a license on the same water issues, uh, the Nairobi County is asking for a license, so you're spending a lot of money on the licenses and then you lose the bigger picture of what is this compliance area about. So if we build capacity of industries and then reduce all this uh, uh, overlapping of regulations so that we have one regulation ad addressing one issue, then we are able to build confidence in the system both from the producer and the consumer on uh, the value of reducing waste in the environment. And as I said earlier, it's about the entire process at the factory. Mm -hmm. How you receive your raw materials, how you produce whatever you're producing, and the kind of output that you give out. So we are building capacity of business models that reduce, you know, you make sure your waste is minimal, if there must be waste. And we have good case examples, I don't need to say them, who are very happy when NEMA shuts their factory because they're like, you know what? They made us think. They made us innovate. They made us realize the amount of waste. And people are selling, uh, saving millions, actually, just from understanding the process, the entire process, and how to minimize waste at every level of the process. And once you do that, then you have the right outputs uh, to the environment in terms of the products that you have, the way they are transported, because you know some waste also is affected by transport systems. Uh, there's a lot of waste in that. Uh, and also the way the consumer receives the product, the content, she was talking about content and labeling, how is the consumer supposed to use that? So also consumer awareness. Awareness, that's why I was bringing in the consumer. How do you consume a product in a sustainable manner? If you're taking it back, the consumer also needs an incentive. I'm told in some European countries, um, there are people who will still throw away bottles. It's not that they are perfect. There's somebody who will still throw away bottles. But another person knows that bottle is three bob. So it doesn't spend time out there. So the consumer also is quickly going to pick that bottle, take it back to get some coins. So it's not that you're not going to have a perfect system, but the incentive for the consumer to take back a product for either recycling or something, it's just that I want us to be cautious that circular economy is not just about recycling, and there's a lot of emphasis on recycling. Uh, and I brought earlier that you can also uh, uh, survive on reuse, a lot of reuse, and remanufacturing or upcycling. So it's not so much recycling, eh? so that the conversation is wider and people can understand the many opportunities around uh, how you work on uh, the different products that they're there. But may, it was, yes. May, may I come in? May yeah, I come yeah, in? Yeah, uh, come in and then you'll <laughs> take a tweet here that's very interesting. Yeah, uh, I'd like to come in on uh, mm -hmm. what Jess is saying and um, also indicate that there's one component that perhaps is missed out and that's adherence to those laws and regulations. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Sometimes yeah. people are aware mm -hmm. that these laws are there, but they're just not adhering. And this can be as an individual, mm -hmm but it can also be at, at the 
farm level. Yes. Mm. So that's, I think, another important component. So how do we create compliance? <laughs> As I said, awareness programs, capacity mm. building. Mm. And once an industry understands what compliance means, you'll be surprised. It's very profitable to be compliant. The compliance issues are not in isolation mm. from the business models. Mm. They're about how does your business model mm. ensure environmental compliance? Mm. And we already have a curriculum on that. So the ones who may not know, first don't have the know-how of how to manage their processes, and secondly, they may not understand the value. So that's why I said awareness and capacity building. Yeah. Capacity building and awareness is from the know-how, the right technologies to use to minimize waste. You've seen even sugarcane juice. There are some juices that finish the entire sugarcane, and there are some that you find this sugarcane surely, or even some fruit juices you find you're trying to juice something out of an, a fruit and the, the equipment is still left with a lot of juice. So it's also about equipment, the kind of technologies we use to minimize waste. Mm -hmm. Then where do you take that waste? So that connectivity or partnerships of somebody who will tell me, I want your waste at this much. That is another big gap that we are working on to match people with waste. Otherwise, if the entire value chain is understood, which could be part of legislation, before you start a business, show me your value chain. Show me that loop of raw materials all the way back so that we are sure you're not going to have a problem. So Joyce, yes. if I'm getting what you're saying, yes. compliance should not be, the police will come arrest me if I don't do. Yes. Compliance should be, this is the business opportunity yes. that lies there really yes. for you. Great, I hear you. Joyce, there's another tweet here I'd like for you to take. How can we get people to learn about segregating their waste from the house? Because it's something you've talked mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. Wow. So awareness, as Joyce was saying, awareness at the industry level is easy because you're able to associate directly to a bottom line that the business then would actually benefit from. Uh, from the consumer point, it's very different because every diff individual is very different. So the way they process information is also very different, even with a lot of consumer awareness and capacity building. So segregation at source is a law. Actually, for instance, in Nairobi County, it exists, and I know many other counties, over 26 counties actually have it within their bylaws. But the challenge is that you and I, in our households, when waste is collected, we're usually given a bag to put our waste in. So the honors to separate the waste lies with me. Um, the waste collector is not giving me that bag. So I, in my own house, I segregate, but I have actually adopted my own uh, receptacle to do that, where I then separate what is recyclable and what is not. So ideally, I do it, all, all my organic waste goes into one thing and then all my inorganics that I think are recyclable go into another. But then I then still have to pick up that bag and then take it to one of our drop-off points, as I said, as Petco. But consumers, these bins are also not everywhere for them to access. And so, for instance, if you're in a rural area, how do you access, how do you uh, recycle that's the question you know because the issue then becomes even if you want to how do you do it okay yes so may, may I come in? <laughs> Jeffrey, mm. go ahead. I'm sorry about this yeah but I, I think that what Jesse is saying is really important eh? mm. and of course it starts with me mm. as an individual but then we also have to think about the social determinants of mm. some of these things uh, perhaps uh, Joyce or perhaps myself yes. um, may be having an infrastructure within the house which I can yes. do this but there are many people who really just don't have that opportunity yes. because of social determinants. Mm. So we have to think about that as mm. well. How do we escalate it to there? Mm. So at that level, they have to be provided with opportunities to do it yes. somewhere outside. Yes. And uh, if, if you are relying on the county governments to do this, uh, I don't think they're necessarily doing a good job because the areas where even uh, you know, rubbish is, has been placed, mm. sometimes they're not collected mm. for for days mm -hmm. and perhaps I, I don't know but may, most likely where Joyce is living perhaps is a private system that they've set up mm -hmm. for to come and do the waste collection mm -hmm. and not relying on the county mm -hmm. so we, we need to have county working for us because mm -hmm. we are also paying um, yes. rates to these people yes. to do certain things yes. which they're not doing mm -hmm. yeah and okay. yeah okay I want you to take this one, Marvin, on Twitter says, there's also controversy over collection of waste. Will we be able to achieve effective recycling when this is there? Um, I think uh, waste collection or waste, uh, in, waste in major urban areas 
it's also big business. Uh, there are people who are making a lot of business doing mm -hmm. these things. And uh, I think even in Dandora, you know, the people who are going there to do recycling, uh, they, they are social strata in some of those places. So, uh, so long as we have that kind of system allowed, you know, to persist, then obviously we'll, we'll always have a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, once, when I happened to have grown up in, in Nairobi in, um, you know, in the 60s and, and early 70s, when waste collection system was very structured. Mm. And uh, well, I was actually living in the Eastlands, but every house had a place to, uh, for, for beans. Eh? And three times a week, they'll come and collect them without fail. People, there were people specifically also ensuring that no waste pillage everywhere. They'll clean them. But that system broke down, and now we have, you know, the, the infrastructure is even worse because even in places where there was a, a proper structure of, of living, mm -hmm. now the, it has been converted into businesses and slums and everything else. So it becomes even much more difficult mm -hmm. to manage such systems. Mm -hmm. So we, we need, uh, uh, you know, a rethink even of how, you know, urbanization is, yes. is undertaken. Proper planning in urbanization will be uh, very important. Okay. Uh, maybe urban renewal will be one way of doing it. And in the process, we build in proper systems of doing everything, including uh, waste collection. Once upon a time in this city, we had industrial area. Such industrial area did not have residential systems. Mm. Now, we have industrial area, but here we have apartments and there we have what? So how do you manage such a system in a good way? You know, it's, it's a big challenge that we have. And I think that's part of the problem we're having even in Raraka, mm. because there are industries, mm. but there are also people living in that area, there are schools, there are what? So the, 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 the whole system um, is not appropriate mm. to do uh, an efficient... So an moving system. forward, what are the tweaks that we need to make here and there? Yeah, we, of, of course, the, um, as we move forward, as we develop areas, uh, we need to have proper urban planning systems. And such planning systems will also have areas, um, you know, stipulated for appropriate waste collection if they are not homes. If they are, you know, apartments, then they place it somewhere. But we also need uh, an effective um, environment department in our respective counties that ensure that uh, they can follow up on that. And then uh, where do we take that waste? We need to have a system maybe of how to, to manage uh, the waste we have other than dumping it in a place like Dandora or burning it or landfill, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So why don't we improve on systems of waste to energy, for instance? And that waste to energy uh, will in help in you know, ensuring that um, what is looked at as, as, as waste subsequently can maybe generate energy. Mm -hmm. uh, so in a way, um, it, is, it is potentially part of the solution, um, not the entire solution. The entire solution is, as just indicated, eh? we need proper education. And I think what CAM is doing with industries, you may find that at farm level, people are now starting to get compliant. But at about at individual levels, mm -hmm. we need a lot of education, a lot of awareness, people to understand mm -hmm. that if you dump things in the environment, it's not good for you, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, as, as an individual as well. So it is a suit of different things to be done, urban planning, um, you know, enforcement, but also efficient management of systems. Um, and, 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 you know, on this, I can tell you that I've seen a situation whereby roads are being done uh, in this city and uh, the storm drain are put into sewage system, right? So what do you expect? When it rains, the sewage bursts. So the whole system is, is uh, need, need to be rethought. Mm -hmm. An overhaul, of, okay, Joyce, go ahead. An overhaul I, of the whole I, I system. Would, I would like to, to, to kind of really, uh, provide some information. You know, um, in May this year, uh, Petco actually partnered with the Nyayo Embakasi Residents Association. Nyayo Mbakasi Estate is actually the second largest estate in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh -huh. And mm -hmm. uh, we decided to test actually segregation at source. Because that being a large area, it's a, a middle class, uh, middle income mm -hmm. area, we decided let's find out if residents are actually willing to recycle, to segregate at source. 
um, because the, we've had all sorts of reasons why people don't segregate at source. So we wanted to test it for ourselves. So what we did was to provide waste receptacles for each of the ATS courts in that um, uh, housing development. And over the last uh, three, four months, we've seen the PET bottles and other plastics also increase by over 30, 40% every month. Mm -hmm. So people desire to do this. We've not provided a waste bag for any household. So people are just collecting in their households and they're taking to that common disposal area, but they're separating it. So what has happened is the, the youth group that we have partnered with to actually uh, collect this and sell it to our recyclers so that they can get a benefit from that are actually collect, collecting uncontaminated bottles. So they're actually fetching a higher price. Our recyclers are much happier because now they don't have to spend that much more energy or water mm -hmm. or even caustic soda, the chemical, to clean this material before they can convert it into something else. Yeah. So I think if this was to be replicated by government actually providing these facilities, as he's saying, within a reach of different people living in different areas, doesn't matter where you are, be it in Kibera. In Kibera we have a program and it's working. So people are collecting, they're, they're collecting for an incentive, the value that they're getting from the bottles, mm -hmm. but they're actually bringing it back we've seen the growth increase exponentially even during the COVID season mm -hmm. so I think the issue is how can government do more because private sector is willing but there's only so much they can do mm -hmm. but how can government actually do more to allow for you and I to effectively segregate at source and to recycle. Mm -hmm. um. Jess, I want to come to you before we cross back over to Twitter. What would be the role of technology in harnessing a circular economy in this country? Wow. I think technology is almost everything <laughs> when it comes to harnessing a circular economy mm -hmm. uh, because technology helps you to uh, optimize resources mm -hmm. in whatever form. If I'm to start with a farmer, if a farmer has the right technology or a tool mm -hmm. to do their farming, they reduce wastage, they don't deplete fertilizers that they're using within the farm, technology and uh, water efficient irrigation schemes so they reduce they don't waste water so just and technology is i look at it in twofold the know-how and the equipment itself so there's that know-how around how to optimize technology and digitization is bringing in a lot of improvements in technology and you find like uh, when it comes to remanufacturing products because you have to dismantle if it's bricks if you are dismantling bricks and, and cleaning them and bringing them back together, you find some uh, economies are using robots. So the time spent is less, the, the waste is less because you, are, you have precision. Mm -hmm. So by the time you are producing a good, there's precision. Somebody has tools knowing this corner can be dismantled, this corner of a table can be dismantled this way. That's the know-how now. And it's standardized, like you're saying, you standardize it. In a way, anybody who studied about making a table can dismantle the table and tomorrow it becomes a picture frame mm -hmm. or it becomes a bed or it becomes a door frame. So that uh, remanufacturing or reusing raw materials for something is all about technology. Mm -hmm. So if you're again looking at the payment system around how you work with your value chain, either in form of information, how do you get information on who has the raw materials in a timely manner, or it's about sending money to the right people to pay for services that you need or to pay for raw materials, or you want to trace back your entire value chain to confirm quality is of the right standard that you had ordered for, that's still technology. So if you are coming also to design a new product, you still need technology, especially because of standardization, and you don't want to waste anything. So the more advanced the technologies that come through, the better for us. If it's water, for instance, uh, in the industries, if I'm choosing examples in the industries, some wash toilets just flash because I've passed. I've not used the toilet. Oh. I've just passed, they flash. That's wrong technology. Mm -hmm. So now we are telling industries, no, no, no. Get the toilet system that flashes because I have used the toilet. Mm -hmm. So already you see the wastage there goes down because of technology. The kind of nozzle I use or tap, if I open a tap and it doesn't have any control, it just pours water at high frequency, already I'm wasting water. And you just need a nozzle that gives me enough to wash my hands. So nozzle use, that's still technology, I'm just on water. If I go to energy, uh, things like the work we do on energy efficiency programs, like uh, looking at the motors and generators being used, some are oversized. 
So you use a lot of diesel that you don't need to use, yet your factory probably is small, you just need to use a little of it. So that oversizing wastes your energy, you're wasting resources, you're emitting you know, a lot of rubbish. Even understanding uh, the type of uh, raw materials that you need. You may use less raw materials if you have the right technology and give you better value. So optimizing first, understanding the right technology, then optimizing it, and then let that technology be integrated. Mm -hmm. In a way, you reduce manual systems that reduce standardization. And when a product is not standardized, recycling it is harder. Mm -hmm. Remanufacturing it is harder. I wish you can see some of the equipments we buy. Although they're imported, you find you're able to do it yourself. Set up, there's a manual. You're able to set it up. You're able to dismantle it, to disassemble it. Mm -hmm. Somebody else is able to use it for something else. I hope you're understanding how technology is helping us with the circular economy. Mm -hmm. Actually, in my view, without technology, circular economy is going to be very hard to implement. That's great. Yeah. That's Joyce's take. I'd like to hear what your take That's is. Remember, you can still talk to us. Strides to sustainability is the hashtag to use at Kenya Association of Manufacturers on Twitter, at Indira Ganga. Let's continue sampling some of the feedback. Um, Joyce, you could probably take this. What are the current executive orders on waste management? Wow. <laughs> well, we've had a, a ban uh, in public uh, spaces uh, specific to single-use plastics. Uh, the president uh, issued that in June last year. It came into effect June this year. Uh, so you're not typically allowed to go with any single-use plastic, a plastic bottle being one of them, but many others. Um, these are typically the plastics you use only once and then dispose of. Uh, within your restricted areas, the parks, the beaches, uh, and other protected areas. Uh, another one has been, of course, the single, the plastic bags. That that is well 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 known. Um, it's been very successful, I must say. Uh, you you don't get to see a lot of these flimsy bags in the trees and other places. Granted, there are challenges. Um, even with this new one, there are challenges. But I think the most important thing, just like Prof was saying, was that. We need to go back as manufacturers and ask ourselves, is every single piece of plastic we're putting out to market and or any other packaging material, is it essential and can it be recycled? Mm -hmm. If it can't, then we do away with it. You, two things, it's profitable to the business. So it might look like it's punitive in the interim, but when we actually sit down and think of what an alternative is or making this product recyclable, then it becomes more profitable to an entity. And for a consumer, um, if you don't need to buy that, don't buy it. It's mm -hmm. that simple. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Prof, probably you could take this because you've spoken about it. At Elvis Never Gets Mad says, will the government take various measures to accelerate the transition to a circular economy? Or rather, what can those measures be? Yeah, I think... Um, the, there is uh, increasing knowledge um, in, in the government sector, um, particularly among the policymakers, about the, uh, the, the, the technology, or the, sorry, the approach, the circular economy approach, and uh, that they will be interested in trying to support that. So uh, I can't talk for the government uh, because I don't work for them, but I think there are opportunities that. Um, are there, and maybe even from what uh, Joyce indicated of what their studies is showing um, in, in waste segregation, shows that, and the government is interested in uh, inclusive jobs and to increase jobs, it shows that there's a lot of opportunities in this uh, for maybe engaging the youth um, in, in jobs. And, and engaging them in a way that they don't have to go to Dandora in a very poor area to, to get this. So they can do legislation that can improve on the infrastructure for recycling. That would be massive if they do that. Uh, because the infrastructure for recycling at the moment the, the is, is very poor. And the, the private sector is trying very hard to do different things. And that's what uh, you're seeing that uh, just is indicating. That's why CAM is, is uh, doing a lot of training for, for different farms. But what is the government doing to support that? You know, they need to ensure that um, they come up with policies. In my opinion, they need to come up with policies first before they come up with the legislation. Mm. Because if they rush into legislation, uh, sometimes we end up uh, finding that uh, 
we can move forward because of one reason or another. But if they do it from a policy perspective, it's going to be more inclusive and um, people are going to discuss it a little bit more so that uh, then the legislation can be based on the policy. Mm -hmm. So if we do things in a systematic way and in join as, man, as many people as possible, the industry is very important, the consumer is very important, the academia, um, the government at the those different levels. Let's look at this together, but let's do it in an excess way. Let's ensure that uh, it is not single sector approach, mm -hmm. uh, that waste management maybe is just for the environment ministry or whatever. Mm -hmm. No, waste management is a health issue. Mm -hmm. The health ministry should be involved. Um, it is an infrastructure issue. The Ministry of Infrastructure should be involved. The Energy Ministry should be involved. Water Ministry. So it is a really nexus of all these activities coming together. Mm -hmm. Let's discuss these issues. And they'll realize that some of the legislation are, are uh, in conflict and they can harmonize that. Mm -hmm. Now, because we are almost to the home stretch of our conversation, I want to stay with you and find out Moving forward, how can the academic world contribute in the creation of a circular economy in the country? Right. Um, I think that uh, we need to work closely with the, with the industry for many reasons. Um, if I may start with the issue of awareness and um, the issue of the youth, mm -hmm. if we just pick those two, mm -hmm. at the moment I don't think there's enough being done, whether the academia uh, maybe the, the, the private sector is perhaps doing more than the academia, but because the youth are, are, and are uh, benefiting. But I believe that uh, we can jointly come up with, with programs or courses, uh, not long-term courses, but courses that are very engaging, that help them to, uh, to be creative uh, in the use of uh, what people are considering as waste. Eh? And if the private industry, for instance, can support that so that the youth do not have to pay so much, but of course they, they need to, um, to show engagement, so there may be some nominal payment from them. Eh? Then we can help them to, uh, to learn more about how they can be creative with what is considered as waste and become more productive uh, from that. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the so-called um, waste, and even perhaps if you just pick recycling industry, Globally is, is a big industry. Maybe you're talking about $200 um, billion, uh, maybe annually, globally. And, um, and I know that, uh, uh, you know, Joyce talked about maybe need that, recycle, that materials manufactured should contain certain proportion that is recycled. But we can also maybe go further than that. We can try to think about um, what material uh, in, that we have in the environment already um, can support certain level of manufacture and that is something that the, the academia can work with the industry to determine mm -hmm. um, you know in, in industrial production uh, what material are there in the environment already that can be incorporated so that the country do not spend more for an exchange importing such material mm -hmm. until we actually utilize what's there but it is something that we can work with the industry for for, for that purpose so i think we can we, we need more engagement with the, with the industry, uh, not only in, um, in industrial production, uh, but also in uh, engaging with, uh, with the education system. Uh, you know, we, we need to ensure, we can work with them uh, in what is not, can be referred to as reverse logistics. Eh? Reverse logistics whereby we see how the consumer, you know, the, or the, uh, the life cycle of a product, when the product comes out, and I think um, Joyce alluded to that, that maybe that should be in the legislation, eh? mm -hmm. but how do the person wanting to do that, you know, come up with that information? Eh? Because it might be, it might actually increase the cost of starting, uh, you know, sort of uh, businesses. But in a way, if say we can work with the industry or with Kenya Association of Manufacturers, mm -hmm. uh, then, uh, and, and specific industries, we can follow the value chain of, of certain activities and see how the consumers are behaving with the product in the end. Mm -hmm. And you know, those kind of uh, research possibilities can help the industry uh, improve uh, on the efficiency of their production, but also see whether maybe certain products uh, need to be limited. But also, the appropriate technology that um, 
uh, Joyce talked about. Yeah, how can we work, can the industry work with the uh, with the researchers, with the universities, to come up with appropriate technology? Because most in most cases, the industry is importing okay. technology, mm -hmm. and sometimes when they import technology, uh, then you find that there's no adequate capacity here even to run it, uh, or if it breaks down, or it end up not being very appropriate. So we need to work together so that uh, that's technology that the industry is using is appropriately is appropriate for our situation okay. yeah and i think many more possibilities mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. joyce i want to find out from you as petco what has been the reception and the attitude of some of your members towards adopting a circular economy well i think um as i said our membership is already a coalition of the willing they already their level of environmental uh, consciousness and sustainability is already um, very high. So their willingness to adopt, to change, uh, redesign is very high. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Biofoods, Unilever, those are our members. And, and even uh, in the coming months, you're going to see more coming out of our membership. You'll begin to see uh, probably for the first time uh, recycled content in our plastic bottles that are used either for cooking oil, milk, or soda, or water, or juice. Um, and that is a big thing, um, especially for our market. But the desire is there. What, what I, as the, uh, as the country manager and lead for this organization, together with CAM, academia, are asking for is, can we have policy that incentivizes others, even who are not within our membership, mm -hmm. to do this and do it bigger, so that it's not just a few people who are doing it. Because if, if in a, a group of 10 bottles, you only have two that are recyclable or that have local content, then it's, 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 it's not beneficial. Mm -hmm. We need all 10 of them to be uniform. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Joyce, I know you're very passionate about the circular economy, <laughs> and I just want to give you a minute to talk to the viewer and tell them why we must adopt a circular economy and now. Well, um, first I want to agree that uh, circular economy delivers jobs. But what is the journey towards getting a job? First, you need to build your skills, your knowledge, your attitude, if you're a young person, for instance. Then besides the job, we are also promoting entrepreneurship and innovations. So I'm still looking at the youth side. So for the youth uh, and the government, how do we come up with incubation centers mm -hmm. where you can get access to the right information, you can understand the market because you know, you again, can, when, when I know that somebody wants a shoe, which I spent probably 20,000, I want it to last long, mm -hmm. then what is that durability around the shoe? So a small business or, or a startup then begins to understand that material with its entire value chain. I know the word value chain sometimes sounds big and uh, many people complain in industry about the vocabularies that are there, like the word circular economy is still a vocabulary. But when you look at industries in Kenya, a lot of them are already applying a lot of circularity in their business. Mm -hmm. Whether you go to Eldoret, you find somebody, a textile company or a tailor, telling you, you know, after I make my uniforms, the waste of the wool, I give to a furniture company that uses it to put inside the pillows, mm -hmm. and then they make the pillows or the chairs. So already that circularity is happening, mm -hmm. but not in a strategic manner. Mm -hmm. So the studies that we need from the academia for just understanding um, enough research of material flow and the different uses of that material give the youth to understand and existing industries. So for us, we know that circular economy delivers jobs. Circular economy delivers profitability. Mm -hmm. And for policies, they need to fall behind, they need to run after innovations. So you see, if you create an innovative system, then a policy comes to see, has this worked? You don't just jump into policies for things mm -hmm. that have not worked. So policies should have business models behind them. Mm -hmm. Understand the business model, understand the consumer, understand the environment, understand resources, and how they can be optimized or reused or whatever, then come up with policies. Because sometimes policies come and nobody has done enough research on generally how those materials are going to be utilized in the economy. Then over time you find, okay, we never noticed a gap here, we have a problem. Mm -hmm. So we go back and say, can we change the legislation? So we are constantly 
criticizing policies and legislations because the, the process within which we develop this is not soundly uh, within innovations and business models that are working. And now we are lucky there are many economies already thriving in that area. So we need to innovate, come up with technologies that will help us scale up. Because again, if you have no technology, you can't scale up. You'll just be doing in your village and supplying your neighbor. And then where is the profitability there? Where is the business? Mm -hmm. So we need to think through what is a business enterprise. Mm -hmm. Yes, not just startups for survival, but startups to serve the communities. Make money while you're at it. Mm -hmm. Deliver jobs. Save the environment. Again, saving the environment is not for the sake of it. It helps us get new materials that we can. It helps the environment regenerate. So if you can think through what can make the environment regenerate so that I never lack raw materials. My neighbor will never lack my input or my output, which is their input. If you think that way, there is no reason why you will not embrace circular economy. Okay. Yes. Now, let me bring in two comments here. Uh, on YouTube, Wamboy Mbarire, CEO of Retrack, says, On the issue of sorting out source, Nema should think or rather rethink the issue of not selling garbage bags in retail outlets. Those willing to do so are hindered by the lack of bags. On Twitter, Jethro Koech says, waste management requires discipline and accountability. I have about three minutes on my clock and we want to drum the circular economy a bit further. Prof, do you know of any success story of an economy that has adopted circular economy and is doing well, very briefly? Yes. Um Den Denmark, mm -hmm. uh, they have um, systems there um, which actually has adopted the system and it's working extremely well. It actually is a very good model that uh, can be used to, um, you know, to support whatever model we are trying to develop. Uh, we can uh, look into how they're doing this and uh, they've been very successful. Of course, there are many other models, particularly China is also doing a lot of this, uh, but, but the model that I think is, is appropriate to use is, is uh, the Danish model. What, what benefit has it had for the Danish people? The, um, first of all, it is based on small businesses, so other than uh, large businesses, and uh, together they, they work in more of what we call industrial symbiosis, uh, where the um, material from one uh, be becomes, sorry, waste from one becomes material for the next one. And it continues until everybody has a product. But aside that, they also have a system of um, ensuring that the energy generated from one is then passed on to the next one. Mm -hmm. So the, th there is efficiency in resource use, but also at the same time, they're keeping material from the environment longer in the system and therefore we have less waste coming out of that. Joyce, success story from Petco. <laughs> Ours of course has been that um, over the last, uh, last year we were able to recycle over 320 million bottles, about 7,700 metric tons, uh, which is about 30% uh, of what we produce. It doesn't look like much, but if you look at the years before, uh, it was only about 8%. So this percent, this year we're also looking to do about 40%. So what has been the success is that putting a value to the waste, to the PET bottle, actually is working. Mm -hmm. And so for us, it's how can we scale it up? How can we deploy it everywhere? And uh, that's where policy comes in, academia to give us the data we need, industry to push membership to join us, mm -hmm. and then we will do the rest. The strides that come? Well, there are many. <laughs> <laughs> Give me three. <laughs> Give me three. Okay, first we've been able to have at least 1,300 companies do energy audits and be able to implement over 50% of uh, what recommendations have come through. They've been able to create jobs because of investments in new technologies, whether it's in renewable uh, technologies like coming up with hydropower plants or biogas. Then you need new skills, you need new people to come and run those uh, plants. People have been able to invest in the right technologies, you know, develop new skills within the business, recreate their products, and that has been huge just from that. We've uh, done uh, at least over 30 feasibility studies on, uh, you know, products that could help them, you know, invest or get financial support. More than 26 projects have been financed uh, through local banks and connections with, on affordable credit. We've had at least 26 water, now, but as of now, we have 40, I mean 30 
water audits done and we can be able to explain the circularity of just water systems within those 30 industries for those who are uh, high water consuming uh, we've been able to train over 400 people in uh, energy management and that is certification but general training over 2,000 people so we've done quite a bit uh, to bring professionalism in the system and most recently we have trained on carbon footprint analysis and now we are doing circular economy training, circular matching, understanding cluster development so that people can be able to build partnerships uh, along the value chain. That's our biggest area. And now, as I said, we have the curriculum for the, for the environmental compliance support program in partnership with the regulators. And as a result, we've now consolidated our efforts around circular economy and uh, we've launched the Center for Green Growth and Climate Change that will now focus heavily on circular economy, uh, material flow, understanding, mm. you know, like Denmark, just to say that when we make waste management a popular subject, there'll come a time we shall import waste. Denmark imports waste. They've worked so hard on their circular loop that they have no waste. Yet they have put up enough equipment to generate heat, to generate electricity with no waste to put in into those uh, uh, facilities. So they're importing from uh, other Nordic countries. So we need to be careful also on uh, the innovations we think around waste management. It's only good now because, uh, of course, we are young, we are so wasteful. But over time, we need to think about prevention, waste prevention, and then invest in tandem around prevention and management. Because if we take a lot of waste management at some point, we'll be struggling with heavy investments and no raw materials in terms of waste to use. Because everybody will have already found a waste. I'll say, please don't sell, throw away your waste, I need it. So we need to get there where there's a grumble for waste. We are all saying, you know, I need your waste, I need your waste because I need it for this product. Consumers need to be aware and value waste because most of us, of course, we don't want to hear this was recycled or this door was gotten from somebody. I want to use door because I find it so easy to recycle or even furniture. You know, our old parents, our parents those days always were replacing materials for the seats but the wood of the seat would stay for many years. Like my mother still has the seats I found when I was born. All we change are just these materials. But us, it's not even the wood we care for, it's a new fashion. So I'm constantly changing my seats every two, three years, I want new seats. So you see already I'm wasting the, the wood and the forestry, which already you know is part of presidential directives to bring our ban on logging because of the wastefulness in the country. Mm -hmm. So let's go circular, let's partner without partnership, both government, the academia, yes. the private sector, the consumers, you know, all those players we need to work together. Nobody will get circular without working across the entire collaborative network. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. That was our ABLE panel. Let me sample some of your views before we mm -hmm. close this session. At Royal Trends Digital says, socially, besides creating jobs, Effective waste management leads to better quality of life for local inhabitants of any area. Goes to uh, good urban cities that Prof talked about. Daniel Mathias says the main advantage of sustainable waste management is to protect the environment by lessening the impact of waste on the environment and contributing to the reduction of greenhouse emissions. Hashtag strides to sustainability. At uh, Daniel Mathia further says, economically, waste management has a big economic potential that needs to be leveraged by public and private entities. Further on, on Twitter, Paul Powell says, um, the uncontrolled growth in urban areas has left many Kenyan cities deficient in infrastructural services such as water supply, sewerage, and municipal solid waste management. Masin Katha says even consumers need to learn and practice circular economy. For instance, hiring wedding dresses, thus reducing the resources used to make wedding dresses to be used uh, for the big day. Elvis Never Get Smart says environmental responsibility is about more than creating an eco-friendly product or initiative. It's about incorporating sustainability into everything we do. Finally, uh, a tweet here says the government 
ought to offer education and information regarding sustainable living. It will promote better behavior and regulations to guide citizens. This is all the time we heard today. It's been such a pleasure together with my panelists to have a conversation on accelerating a circular economy in Kenya. Remember, this conversation does not stop here. It continues online. The hashtag to use is strides to sustainability at Ndiro Ganga at Kenya Association of Manufacturers at the handles to Twitters too. We'll see you next time. But until that time, here's a little bit food for thought for you. If we look at the European Union, just by adopting a circular economy, they were able to create 580,000 new jobs and they were able to save at least 600 billion euros. This is 8% increase in their annual turnover. If you're still thinking about a circular economy and adopting it, I hope we've given you reason enough to rethink and adopt. My name is Ndura Ganga. It's been a pleasure.